Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Age Better, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and yep, age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. So today we're diving into a topic that's both empowering and liberating, embracing the idea that getting older is absolutely okay. And who better to join me in this conversation than the woman who actually wrote the book, It's Okay to Be Old. Yep, it's really called that. Patricia Greenberg is the author of the newly released book, It's Okay to Be Old, Thoughtful Acceptance of Your Age. And she's an absolute expert on all things related to aging well. And she's not just talking the talk. Patricia is living proof that you can age with energy, grace, and a whole lot of joy. She's the host of Age Well, a weekly YouTube show, and is a sought-after national expert sharing her wisdom on TV, radio, podcasts, and conferences across the country. But Patricia's passion for wellness doesn't stop there. She's run 20 marathons, 115 half marathons, She's climbed towers and stadiums all across the country and now channels her energy into yin yoga and hitting the gym to keep her bones strong. Oh, I like that, as you all know. And when she's not busy being a wellness warrior, Patricia enjoys knitting, just like me. I love knitting. We have so much in common. I can't wait to get this conversation started. So in today's episode, we'll explore what it truly means to embrace your age debunk some of the myths about getting older, and discuss how to find peace, joy, and strength in every stage of life. So you know what to do. Pop in your earbuds, take me with you for a heart-healthy walk while you listen to this really fun chat, and get ready to age better. Stay tuned. This episode is supported by FX's Grotesquerie, a new series from executive producer Ryan Murphy. Heinous crimes unsettle a small community, and the local detective feels these atrocities are eerily personal, as if someone or something is taunting her. Starring Nisi Nash Betts, Courtney B. Vance, Leslie Manville, and Travis Kelsey, FX's Grotesquerie premieres September 25th on FX. Stream on Hulu. Reporting live from under my blanket, I'm Susan Curtis with Duncan at Home. Breaking news, pumpkin spice iced and hot coffees are back. I'll pass it to Mr. Curtis with his blanket for the full story. That is so right, Susan. You know, it's never too early to get in a spicy mood. I'm talking cinnamony goodness that's so tasty, people don't want to leave their blankets either. Back to you. Mmm, no, back to you. (laughs) Ah, all you. The home with Duncan Pumpkin Spice is where you want to be. Hey, Patricia, welcome to Age Better. Hi, how are you, Barbara? I'm good. And today we're talking about one of my favorite topics of all time, aging better. Aging better. And aging, <laughs> just aging, and <laughs> getting older. Old, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. let's get right into it. Sure. And you've written that incredible book, It's Okay to Be Old. I love it. We'll be talking about that shortly. But, but let's talk about that word, old. I mean, I really think, I know you agree, it's changed. Like the definition of old has changed with each generation, maybe even with each decade, each year. But anyway, how do you define old? What is old? Are we old? What is old? Okay. So the title of the book is It's Okay to Be Old. And it's kind of tongue in cheek because everybody is walking around saying, am I old? And people are asking me, what is old? What does it mean to be old? Old is a term for where you are in the cycle of life, like a teen or a child or an adolescent or an older adult or a middle-aged adult. You're an older adult. So are you old? You know where I define old? Old is that, I hate to break the news to you, but the average lifespan is still in late 70s, early 80s for most Americans. Mm -hmm. So as you're getting closer to that, you are old. But let's get away from the connotation of old and let's embrace it. That is a time to be reveled, to be new beginnings. When you're older, there's a whole new world out there for you of an outlook on life, 
of a way to see the world, of a way to experience the world. So when I say it's okay to be old, it's okay to be in that place in your life where you're on the back nine, okay? And there are less years in front of you than there are behind you. Mm -hmm. And that's what it means to be old. And I'm trying to take that word and make it lovely. So where did this come from? I know you and I could be here all day. So I try to keep these brief as possible. But it came from the 1933 Social Securities Act, where 65 was defined as old. And that meant it was time for you to stop working. And when it was established, it was more likely that you would not live to be 70. Okay, the, the lifespan was much shorter. Also, there was a connotation is that when you reach that certain age in life, it was time to stop working. It was time to slow down. All these negative terms that we kind of associate with that time and retire. And retirement was mandatory and it was worse for women, as we know. So Mm -hmm. you were shown the door at 65, whether you like it or not, whether you were spry and ready to go, or you really were having difficulties, whether it's cognitively, mentally, or physically, and you you were shown the door and asked to leave. And everybody bought into that. Well, I'm 65. I'm old. I'm 65. I can't work anymore. And that hasn't quite left our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you and I know, full disclosure, Barbara and I run marathons, and we're both (laughs) in the 60s. And we talk about it a lot. And I go out there, some of my best friends are marathon runners, and they're in their 70s and a few people in their 80s. So that, are they outliers? You know, we're getting to a point where that's all starting to come together. It's not so far-fetched to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the term old really means a place in your life, a part of the, where are you on the, the life cycle? Right. But then you shouldn't let it define you, right? I mean, there are some people I'm sure listening right now or watching right now who are saying, well, I I don't feel old. So should I be in the category of old? I mean, I'm 67, Patricia, Mm -hmm. and I feel great. And you're right. I do mention in the introduction that we both run marathons. You run, ran, I think, 20 marathons Mm -hmm. and a hundred and 50 or so, half marathons, so on and so forth, so many races, and you still have a lot in you, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked offline, we don't feel old. So should the word old be applied to us? Do we need that kind of name? So that's precisely (laughs) what I'm saying. You you say old. I I know, it sounds negative, doesn't it? No, you're right. It's just a part of where you are in the timeline. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, I'll accept that. And then, of course, tongue in shape. Yeah. But then we've also heard of the oldest old. And that really is like people, I don't know for sure, like sociologists might say 75, 80 and on. Or the the oldest old is now, um, I have the science on this. Oh, what is that? It's about 85 and above. Okay. People start getting into their 90s and their hundreds. And if they're phenomenal, they're called super agers. Yes. And what's interesting about this, I'm going to let you guide me, but I'm, you know, I'm going to go off on these tangents. When you look at a super ager and you see somebody who's 95, 98, 100, 101, 105, every day counts. It's no longer, you know, I hope I have a five year plan when I'm 100, but uh, <laughs> people in that age group do tell me that every morning they wake up, they're thrilled that they woke up. Yeah, they I'm savor happy. every day, yeah, every moment. Mm-hmm. She tells me that all. We the should time. all do that. Right. So that's a super ager and that is old. But again, by the definition is the actual chronological age. So let's clarify that. Are you old by your chronological age? Yes. Let's stop equating with old with decrepit. Old does not equal decrepit. Old equals a certain chronological age. So that's my clarification on on the definition. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. You have changed my mind and my thinking about the word old. I am old. I say it all the time to my family. Sometimes when I'm do, like in the store or something, I don't know. I'm just an old lady. Don't, yeah, don't mind do me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So you've said, and you've written in your book that the best way to age well is to stop caring about what other people think. That's easier said than done. I mean, we all kind of want to feel that way. Like, I don't really care what anybody thinks. But I do have to say, the older I get, and I think you hear this from many other people in our age group, Mm -hmm. the older I get, the less I do care what other people think of me 
or how they think of me or what they say about me. So I get this is a really good thing. So I really love that. So how do you think this shift in mindset impacts our lives and how we think about aging? Well, that's where I want to reframe caring what people think. And I always use this analogy is that you care less about what people think because you're replacing it and caring more about what's good for you. Okay. It's, you're just replacing. There should be no anger associated with it, or there's certain things we feel a sense of loss with as we age because you cared so much about looking good in a bikini, or you cared so much about that your house was just right, or when company came over, the food was delicious. And we've all lived this. My God, what if they don't like it? What if they don't like me? What if I'm not wearing the right outfit at the party? Your whole frame of reference almost naturally changes because you have to feel healthy and comfortable in your own place, your own space. And when you allow that in, you will naturally stop caring what people think. Mm -hmm. The picture on that is that how much are you giving up by caring what people think? And that's what you have to, and that's everybody's individual path. If I care too much what people think, am I giving up my own comfort? And are you jeopardizing your happiness? And, And are you putting yourself in a situation that's dangerous? Because you're, you're, you know, you're going to jump off a cliff with everybody else because you don't want them to think you're old. There's things that that's an extreme example, but I don't want to, you know, I have friends, Barbara, you and I've talked about this. So many people along with the aging, with fitness, they go from running to walking or they go from the gym to switching over to yoga because it's more gentle. And that is not a giving up. That is not a, it's again, You're caring more about what's good for your body as you go. Try to equate that with caring what people think. I went to a wedding recently overseas, so I had to be very careful what I was packing. And the family kept saying, it's really formal. It's really formal. My daughter and I are like, what if we're not dressed nicely enough? Or what if we don't look good? And finally, I just said, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to wear a dress that I like that's comfortable. I had recently had a hip replacement. I had to wear low-heeled shoes. We went and we were two of the best dressed girls in the room. So even though both were formal, a lot of people said same thing I did. I'm going to wear what I'm going to wear. I had a very nice dress on, but I wasn't wearing a Dior gown. And nobody cared. I didn't care. Nobody cared. We had a fabulous evening. And you had a great time. Absolutely. But we don't want people to equate this mindset with like letting yourself go. Like, oh, no. I don't care what anybody says. So I'm not going to take a shower for a week or... I'm not going to work out. It just doesn't matter anymore. No, 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 no. Because that is all part of your self-care and physical health and mental health and all that good stuff. I love that. I love the freedom of not really caring about what other people think and just being comfortable in your own skin. And let's talk about being comfortable with your own age. (laughs) It's so funny when we think about generations ago where no woman would ever reveal their true age. Either they felt like they were too young, you know, when they were back in their teens or whatever to do something. And then of course, as they got older, they certainly wanted to protect that information from the world. But that's not really true, I think, of most women I know in this age group. I think more and more women are becoming more comfortable. Like I see a real change since I hit my 50s and have been kind of more cognizant of aging and how we talk about aging. What do you say to that, Patricia? It's an amazing question. And one thing that I, and I do, I speak extensively. I write extensively about it and I speak extensively about it. We could devote an entire show about lying about your age. Mm -hmm. I'm laughing when you said when we were teenagers and we wanted to be 21 so we could go to a bar and drink or... (laughs) I remember lying about my age to get a job. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you hit that point where, and you know, we're old enough, unfortunately, we're old enough to know when 30 was considered old and 40 was beyond. A woman who was 40 was really put out to pasture on many Mm -hmm. levels. And so now I think what is important to know about your age is you're only lying to yourself. You're only hurting yourself when you lie about your age because it's important for you to know medically how old you are chronologically. It's important for people around you that if you need something for them to know exactly how old you are. Where it gets tricky is people don't want to admit their age in the workplace. 
that's still lagging behind is yeah there's still ageism, ageism in the workplace gender ageism yep sexism ageism sexism, all of it is mm-hmm. still unfortunately a big ball of fire going on in the workplace in the corporate world and even yeah. in small business so i've seen it i've gone out with a group of people i've gone to a work event where there's a lot of people who are a lot younger than me and i have the reaction i think Okay, as soon as I tell them how old I am, what are they going to do? Now I walk in, you know, I'm here, I'm 63, get used to it. <laughs> That's what I've become. <laughs> I've become like an activist, you know, where I'm just screaming my age from the rooftop. But it's important for you and your wellness. And you asked earlier, how does that shape how you feel about aging and how you age? It says everything. Because if I say, okay, I'm 63, what are my limitations? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What have I earned? What have I, I gained from the world by becoming 63? And that's a tremendous amount. And you find that same thing about empowering with your looks or not caring what people think. Use your age in your favor. Use your age as a way to say, I have experience. I have a lifetime of joy. And if I'm out with someone and they're younger than me or older than me or my age, and they're picking on me because of my age, that's not where you want to be. You Again, I speak feel so strongly and speak a lot about embracing your age and finding people that are your age that you can relate to. Your peers are your best advisors. Mm-hmm. People around you are going to... And then have, have you had this, Barbara, where you meet people because you look beautiful for your age and people say to you, oh my God, you're 67. I can't believe it. Yeah. Yes. And it's a lot of people I'm sure say that to you, but don't you find they feel some relief? I'm so glad I finally, I'm finding somebody my own age I can talk to. You know, <laughs> that, that's, you know, that's what they might look at you and think, well, she's too young. She doesn't understand. Yeah. But once they find out how old you are, they're thrilled. I get that all the time when people find out how old, oh, really? I thought you were younger. Well, can I talk to you about such and such? It opens the conversation and it opens your heart to be open to the world and to just yep. look around and, you know, you've seen 63 years and 67 years and a million sunsets. Yeah. It's so hard for me to believe that I'm 67 because I know so many of us can say in our heads, we still feel like we're 16 some days, you know, 25 or 50 or, <laughs> you know, it's really just so funny. But very quick story when I did say at the beginning of this question that I do feel more women that I encounter are accepting and embracing their age. Mm -hmm. But when my first book came out when I was 50, actually a little over 50, I started writing it at 50 when I turned 50 and was like, what? What do I do now? I need a guidebook that did not exist. And so I wrote it. And I just felt that we were still in a stage in society, in this country of not embracing our age, of still hiding our age, of fighting aging. Like that is what all the magazine articles were about. Nobody was talking about how to embrace your age and just be the best age you can be. And that's what I was really looking for in a book at that time. And so at that time, I was a lone voice in the wilderness. And I'm very pleased to see the development in this conversation and the way we talk and the words we use and the terms we use and the mindsets that we have about aging since then. So it's been 17 years. And I wouldn't say it's a sea change because as we pointed out, there still is ageism in the workplace and in other places. Certainly, I think when women go out there and start dating again, maybe after being married for decades and they're single again, it isn't always easy. There's a lot of ageism out there. So we know that. But there is a really positive development in the direction of embracing our age. In fact, my last book was called Love Your Age. (laughs) That's what it's all about. And just be the best you can be whatever age you are, whether it's 18 or 80 and everything in between and beyond that. But anyway. I think some of the driving force behind this for everybody is fear of dying. The the fear- Sure. The fear of the the end game starts so early. Well, people die when they're 65. People die when they're 70. So if I just keep saying I'm 39, I'll escape that. Mm -hmm. It's delusional, needless to say, but there's a lot of that going on. I, I see people that it's like, 
I don't want to be decrepit. I don't want to have dementia. I don't want to be reliant on my children. I don't want to. It all stems from that, that fear of not being here anymore. Yeah, that's a really good point you're raising. And then let's like expand on that. It's like everyone listening, the way that you can counter some of those things is by taking care of yourself yes. and exercising and not slowing down, which leads me to my, les- my next question is that so many of us think like, like you said earlier in this conversation, like once you hit a certain age, when you get old, that maybe you start to slow down or you should start to slow down. And you and I completely disagree with that. Yes. Why don't you talk about that? So this is what, again, language dictates our response to things in so many ways. So we hear, oh, you know, she's slowing down. She's in her 60s. We may appear slower to other people, but you know what I attribute that to? You're not slowing down. You are finally, for the first time in your life, you're not jumping the gun. You're not competing to answer the question first. You don't need to be front in line. You don't need to have the last word. You're thoughtful. So if someone asks you a question, you don't say, oh, yeah, really? Well, when I did it, it was, you stop and you lean back and you go, let me give a thoughtful answer here. Let me stop and think about how I want to respond to this. I don't want to respond in anger, even if I am. I don't want to respond by saying, you don't know what you're talking about. So you stop, you take a minute, and you're thoughtful, and then you answer. And people might perceive that, that you're slow and you're taking too long to answer the question. Do you see how easily yeah. it's be interpreted? It's very interesting. Also, mm-hmm. when you get up in the morning, I told you I had this conversation with someone who said, well, my friend's in her 60s and she says it's hard to get out of bed. It should not be hard for you to get out of bed in your 60s and it should not be hard for you to get out of bed in your 70s. If it is, I urge you to go get a physical, both psychological and physical examination to see if something's going on that's causing you to feel that way. You should be perfectly capable of getting up, getting out of bed, and getting on with your day. You might be having a thoughtful moment. You know, when we were younger and you had to get to work and you had to be on top, you jumped out of bed, you flew across the room, you threw on whatever you could out the door, not a care in the world who was in your way. You were just going to bulldoze and steamroll everybody to get where you needed to be. That's when you were 25, (laughs) right? When you're 65, it's like, Okay, I'll put one foot on the floor. I'll put the next foot on the floor. I'll go get my coffee and I'll get on with my day. That's not because there's something wrong with you. It's because you're thoughtful. And yeah, I love thoughtful. it. I, I just was thoughtful. picturing, yeah. Thoughtful acceptance of your age. Every, oh, I love the cover of your book. It's so great and colorful. And thought through <laughs> and not crazy and not insane and not, you know, yeah. Absolutely. So. I just was laughing too because I was picturing myself what am I like in the morning now? Like I am always awake before my, my husband. And so I look over, he's usually sleeping. And my dog also on the bed is usually sleeping. And then I, I have my Apple watch on and I click on the breathe yeah. app mm-hmm. and then I breathe for a minute. And then I check how my sleep went. And then I very thoughtfully get out of bed and carry on with my day, go have my Nespresso, my first of yes. two. and. Yeah, everything is a bit more thoughtful. Yeah, yeah. I love that. that. But you don't you're feel right. Slow, right? You don't feel like you're damaged or anything's wrong. You're just Oh, no, I like it. Taking a different approach. Yeah. I want to add on to that about exercise too. Well, we're getting to that. Let's let's go right into that nutrition, exercise. You're very very much involved in that world. Yes. Let's talk about that and how important those things are as part of your own self-care to build your self-esteem, to feel stronger, to feel better, to age better. Tell us about that. Yeah. So overall, nutrition and fitness go hand in hand in in aging. And I want to take away that feeling of a cookie is bad and an apple is good. Going to the gym is fabulous and staying home and watching a movie is horrible. There seems to be people don't embrace the in-between. I'm an avid knitter. With all that I do all day and all the crazy. Me too. We talked about this. We're both knitters. <laughs> I love to sit on the couch and knit and binge on Netflix at night. That's thoughtful. I love it. And I think about that's what I'm going to do. I exercise during the day. I fit it in. So where I'm going with this is that bite-sized solutions. Try to be mindful throughout the day 
of eating well, making a little bit better choices, and make sure you're moving three 10-minute segments a day of getting up from your desk, walking around, having a pair of weights around the house, picking it up, and just doing some movement is fine. It's a start. Get a goal. You must have a goal. You must say, this is what, don't say, I want to weigh 120 pounds or I want to weigh 130 pounds. Say, I want to feel better about myself. I want to feel good. I want to feel energized. I want to stave off the ill effects of, as we get older, cholesterol's rising, blood pressure's rising. What can I do? Now, there are many people who have compromised health systems for a variety of reasons, but there's so much you could be doing. So it's bite size little throughout the day. And the one thing that I am a little bit hard on and beat people over the head with is processed foods. And that's a whole nother afternoon of conversation. But when you choose something, choose the most natural and quality product that you can. You want a piece of chocolate? Don't eat a bag of M&Ms. Go out and buy a nice chocolate bar. If you want to have, go out and indulge in a, in a wonderful meal, just order healthy side choices. Order the steamed broccoli instead of the string beans drenched in a mayonnaise sauce. They're tiny little steps that make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And again, Barbara, I'm going to circle back to don't care what people think. You're out in a restaurant or you're at an event and you need to take care of yourself. You take care of yourself. Do not be embarrassed to order seltzer water instead of an alcoholic beverage if that's where you're at. Do not be ashamed to turn down dessert even if it's your birthday party and you say, hey, you know, tonight I'd rather just not have, it's fine. That's it. It's up to you. It's your life. It's your body. It's your choice. So that ties in together. And I always say, bottom line, the way you take care of yourself on a daily basis is 100% based on where your self-esteem is at that moment. So if you're not feeling good about yourself or you're caring what people think, or you're so scared someone's going to like you, or you go out on a date, especially older dating, and you want to make an impression, you're shortchanging yourself. So be who you are, be authentic. And one of the things I always say is grab a friend, go for a walk where there's trees. You've got the three biggies. You've got your body is upright. God wants your body upright. Nature is designed to force you to stand up. You breathe better, your digestion works, and there's something called proprioception. And that is your sense of where you are in the world, where you are on the planet. NASA studies this extensively with astronauts because there's no gravity. So proprioception tells you peripheral, how far things away, your depth, how far away the ground is. And that does decline with age, especially if you're not well. Mm -hmm. How many of you have seen an older person get to the corner and just fall right down and plop on their face? And you say, didn't they see the curb? They didn't because their proprioception's off. Walking, 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 I can't say enough about it, helps sustain your proprioception. Walking among nature, trees and flowers and plants let off compounds that actually relax your body and calm your body down. So you're upright, you're breathing, your digestion is moving, your body's calming down. A calm body is a happy body, is a healthy body. And if you have a friend with you, you're having that interaction, that community. Right. One person can make all the difference in your life. One person in the world can make you feel like a million bucks. You know, I have a friend who started this walking community called 99 Walks, Joyce Shulman. I don't know if you know her, I've but she's it, been I've on the show a couple of times. She's written a few books about walking and she's also a, a weight trainer, oh, okay. but she really believes in the power of walking. And every time she's on, she convinces me and everyone <laughs> listening in once again, how important it is. But let's talk about this concept of peacefulness, a peaceful body, what you just described. I was kind of thinking about it, walking in nature with a friend. I mean, you're, you know, you're really checking off all the boxes with a nice walk in nature with a friend. Couldn't be healthier physically as well as uh, emotionally. So what are some practical ways? I know you have found a few yourself, practical ways to bring like peacefulness and joy into your life in ways that people can start to embrace today? I tell everybody again, don't rush anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whether you're walking slow, walking fast, it doesn't matter. You're walking. You take that extra step again to keep your body upright. And if the weather's not so hot, go somewhere indoors where you can walk, go to a public place 
And the other thing that I do, Barbara, is I stair climb. I stair climb incessantly. I did competitive stair climbing. So if you're walking- I didn't know that was the thing. Competitive stair climbing? Well, I know you've climbed up uh, towers and the Empire State Building and- (laughs) It's just like a race and you get a medal at the top. So I add that in a little bit of a, maybe I'll hop up a couple of stairs while I'm walking, but everything should be approached calmly. And something in Eastern medicine, in Chinese and in Indian medicine and Ayurvedic is that they pay attention to is how quickly or how slowly you eat affects your wellness and your calmness. The golden standard, if you can believe it, is to chew your food 40 times before you swallow it. Yeah. So I tell people, try 20. So when you're sitting at a table, no matter how hungry you are, have a glass of water because often hunger is mistaken for thirst. Have a glass of water and while you're eating, pick your fork up slowly, chew your food slowly, swallow it and engage in the beauty of the meal. And I know this sounds so out there and so hippy dippy, and but it's true. When you sit down to have dinner, instead of opening a bag of potato chips in front of the TV, be mindful about how you eat, not just what you eat. And it slows everything down. It makes the digestion more efficient. The same thing when you go to the bathroom, if you don't mind my being graphic. We go to the bathroom and we're pushing everything out and we're standing halfway on the toilet peeing. You got to pee, you got to get it over with, and you got to leave. All of these things should be done slowly and carefully and thought through. And I've timed, I've timed myself doing things that I rush. Like I remember, you know, your gas tank, you go somewhere. I'm in LA, so we drive all the time. And the gas gauge is going down and going down. And I'm too busy and I'm running around. One day I got out of the car. My car was empty. It was on empty. I pulled into the gas station. I actually timed how long it takes to put gas in your car. I did it in under five minutes. So does it ruin your life to go stop and get gas? No. (laughs) It saves your life because you need it. Okay? Does it ruin your life to sit down and take that extra five or 10 minutes to just have your meal slowly? No. Mm -hmm. And again, when your emotions are running high and you just want to scream, take a second and respond this much, just a tiny smidge slower. It makes all the difference in the world in calming your body down. And you know what? I guarantee you, you'll sleep better. You won't have that antsy, angst feeling at night. Mm -hmm. I didn't get this done today. I didn't get that done today. How long is it going to take you? It's going to add five minutes onto my day tomorrow. It's going to add 10 minutes onto my day tomorrow. Thoughtful, 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 thoughtful in everything that we do. And that circles back to, I appreciate that I, I think this way because I'm in my 60s. I didn't think this way five years ago or 10 years ago. Forget no, it. And I, no. when I was 40, I was just start. I, I had my daughter at 40 and yeah. I was running and I was writing a book, a new book, because I have five out now. And I was just, I didn't stop and I'm organizing my husband's clothes and I'm making dinner and I'm working and I'm picking my daughter up at school and I'm going. And then somewhere in there, you can relate to this. I go do a 15 mile run because I had a marathon coming up. <laughs> and then I just realized now looking back, that was insane. So mm-hmm. yeah, trying yet to- we did it. We did it. Yeah. We did it. And yeah. it isn't age related. It's thoughtfulness. It's total mm. thoughtfulness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a wonderful way of thinking. I really do appreciate that. Let's talk about your book for a minute. It's Okay to Be Old. I love the title. Let's talk Thank about you. what made you decide to write it. So it was a, a long time coming on one hand, and I, I'm trained as a nutritionist. My degree is in nutrition and food science. I'm a professionally trained chef, and for the bulk of my career, I taught in culinary schools. So I taught chefs and food professionals how to put a little bit of a more nutritional spin on their food, as well as, again, thoughtfulness and mindfulness in eating. And through that, I did so much teaching and public speaking. I started to do some television and radio, and people said, hey, you're really good at this. And through a very serendipitous chain of events, I was a a guest on a show, and the host pulled me over afterwards, and he says, you know, you're really good at this. Do you want my show? Do I want your show? He goes, no, it's, it was public radio at Cal State Northridge in 2000. And he said, I want to give up the show. And he was interviewing chefs and food professionals. And he said, you're really good. My business is called The Fitness Gourmet. And we moved it to drive time. And I took over. It was like, again, that doesn't happen to anybody. 
That's sitting at Schwab's drugstore getting discovered by. <laughs> that's, that was that's a very great unusual, story. Very unusual way to happen. So I was at Cal State Northridge for eight years doing the show called The Fitness Gourmet. And we started incorporating everything in, not just about food, but wellness and health. And I loved hearing the stories of how people got to where they did in their career through food or wellness, whatever. And again, all these serendipitous twists and turns to get there. And so I was there for eight years and then they closed the show. It was PBS and they couldn't keep it going. Yeah. And I said, you know, I was spending more time at home. And I said to my daughter, we should write a book about healthy cooking for children. She goes, mommy, you don't know, you don't know what kids, you know how kids are. You don't know what kids like to eat. And I said, well, tell me. She was early high school at the time. Mm -hmm. So we went to her high school and we did a survey. Like a focus group. Yes. And we had the kids participate. And I ended up writing a book called Scrumptious Sandwich Salads and Snacks for Work, Home, and School. And it was tiny Great little size recipes that parents could do with their children quickly or freeze ahead, small quantities, small batches to take to school and to learn about it. And so from that, what I started to see, because in my own home, my daughter was a teenager. My stepson came back to live with us in his 30s. I was in my 50s. My husband is 14 years older than me, so he was in his late 60s. And we had my 103-year-old mother-in-law in the house. So I had to prepare food from wow. 13 to 100. And I realized what I'm all the things I'm saying really applies to you at any age. Mm -hmm. So what's going on that when we get older, why is it treated so differently? What's the difference? What happens? Combined with the fact, Barbara, because I had my daughter at 40, the other mothers at school, I'm 40 and they're 25. And then as she got older and I got into my 50s, the high school mothers were, you know, in their late 30s, early 40s. Yeah. They never said to me, you're old, but they say things like, you run marathons? Women over 40 aren't supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what they would say to me? You're running around in stretch pants at your age? <laughs> like, wow. Crazy stuff. Oh my gosh. Like throwback to the 50s. Of course I'm running around in stretch pants, stretch pants. I'm wearing leggings to go running. So it was interesting to me that, and I thought, I'm right here in LA. There's so many people out of touch with what this process is. That's mm -hmm. when I got interested in, in how we age. And I mm -hmm. started to really research it and see what is it that we need. And then my previous book, Eat Well, Live Well, Age Well came out. And that was more that guide when you're reaching that late 40s, early 50s, menopause, male pause, all the things that are going on in those years. What can we do to preserve ourselves for later in life? Mm -hmm. Then I reached my 60s and I thought, you know, nobody wants to hear me say drink water, eat vegetables and exercise every day. How do we navigate those years once you get there? Most importantly, and that's when I said, okay, and we were playing around with titles and I thought, we're talking to people who grew up in the 60s and 70s and it's radical and we're going to change and we're going to change the world and we're going to do this. And my brother stopped me and he said, no, that's not what we're doing. He's a year older than me. He said, that's not what we're doing because he helped me tremendously with the book. He did all the design, Burt Green, Fine Arts, if I can give him a shout out. And he said, how about thoughtful acceptance? not radical acceptance, you know, we're going to be like the Gray Panthers and this and that, the Black Panthers who are now the Gray Panthers. I'm sure you've heard about them. All these terminology that was coming up. And I said, you're right, thoughtful. We need to be more thoughtful. So I'm, even though I'm doing it and I've been doing it for a while, that wasn't the word I was using. You know, right. so now I'm saying right. it is thoughtful acceptance of your age. It's okay to be old. It's okay to be 65, 75, 85, 95. I wrote that out inside the book. I talk about your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, your 90s. But it's okay to be in this giant demographic that we're calling old now. There were mm -hmm. no baby boomers is a negative connotation. You know, you wear that now? Boomers, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bo very boomers negative right now. Yep. Senior is a bad word. Boomer is a bad word. Silver yep. tsunami is a bad word. And certainly geezer and gray hair and what's the other one? The blue hair, all these terms, you're absolutely not allowed to use it for someone older. So I'm not going to tiptoe around it. If there's words that come out of my mouth because I grew up in the 70s, they're just going to come out of my mouth. I can't, I'm not going to dance around it. And I do work with people. There's a wonderful organization called Changing the Narrative, where they're talking extensively about how do we address and how do we speak about seniors. 
instead of all the negative birthday cards, you're over the hill and mm-hmm. you know, it's tombstone on the cover of the card and all this. Mm-hmm. We're trying to change that. And I agree with that completely, but I want everybody to just relax. That's part of being calm. If you say it, if you use it, if someone says it about you, let it go. It's okay. It's so much more important that you're happy today than worried about what somebody's calling you. Yeah. I mean, it's just words, just words, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It's just words. And we have to remember that. I love your book. And mm-hmm. I think everyone should run out and get a copy of it. Thank Thank we'll have links in the show notes and the description box about how to get it. And I really, really thank you for joining me today, Patricia. It was a fun conversation. My pleasure, I love talking about embracing your age, loving your age, and do everything you can to really age better. So thank you for that. And I know you'll come back because we really have a lot more to talk about, but we've run out of time. And you'll be on my show. We'll figure that out. We'll do some crossover episodes. Oh, thank you. Looking forward to it. And thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Age Better Podcast, please do a few things. First, share it with all your friends and family. Then, subscribe to Age Better wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Finally, if you have ideas for topics you want me to cover in a future episode of Age Better, send an email to agebetterpodcast at gmail.com or reach out to me on social media. Until next time, remember this. We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice women's voices amplified.